Hello, this is Café Hell in Kufstein in the Austrian Tyrol, and this ice cream is called the Kufstein Organ. Mmm. Mm. This is the original non-fattening Kufstein organ, built inside an ancient fortress to commemorate the fallen of the Great War. This giant instrument is played 365 days a year for a special 20-minute recital and is nothing if not loud. Its unique sound can be heard not only by the tourists who gather around the organist's hut at the foot of the castle, but throughout the town and right across the valley. From the 19th century onwards, the organ went walkabout. It escaped from its traditional home, the church, and found itself in more and more unexpected places, like this fortress in the Tyrol. And quite honestly, once it did get out into the world, it went ever so slightly mad. It got bigger, it got louder, and it got attitude. And to build big, loud organs with attitude, not surprisingly required vast sums of money. The richest people in the world have always had a bit of a thing about having their own organs. And in the 19th century, the richest people in the world were British. This is Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire, the ancestral home of the Dukes of Marlborough. Now, if I had to make a list of the ten most beautiful organs in England, this organ would certainly be on that list. A grateful monarch gave the fantastic palace in which it stands to the Duke of Marlborough as a reward for winning the Battle of Blenheim, which was in 1704, as you know. Now, 150 years later, a descendant of his, the eighth Duke of Marlborough, commissioned an organ. Well, actually, he installed two. He didn't like the first one, and he replaced it with this, which was an excellent decision, because this instrument was built in 1891 by the finest of the English Victorian organ builders, Henry, or Father, Willis. The current Duke of Marlborough heard me playing and came to see what was going on. Hey, Hello. Grace. Good afternoon. Um, it's a wonderful treat to come and hear this and see and play this beautiful instrument. Um, now, you put in motion some very serious restoration work on this organ. Well, I was the owner of this wonderful instrument and I said that uh, we must put it back to what it should be. Now, you say that you don't play at all, but your grandfather did something to this organ which is rather unique, didn't he? Perhaps you could tell us about that. Well, the, the, the pianola, uh, yes. the, the organola, whatever it's called, which <laughs> plays roles. Uh, there was a quite an amusing story about this uh, whelp player, actually. My grandfather was entertaining some people here yeah. one evening and he wanted to pretend to them that he could uh, play the organ, so he had this all set up. Unfortunately, just before he got to the chair, the thing started playing. <laughs> there, there was a technical hitch and he was caught out. <laughs> well, it probably serves him right, I think, <laughs> pretending to play. Shall we go up and have a look at it? Yeah. Uh, it's really just a large box from this view, isn't That's it? That's right. You, um, could, you could call it a duke box. Uh, well, you could do. <laughs> I gather we, we, we move this down do. yeah. and up. The other and, one. And That's right. Any moment. Now right. Wagner should come out of the organ. Now, I'm going to have to go and help pull the stops out, aren't I? Yes, that's it's... right.
In 19th century England, the organ became fashionable, and not just in stately homes. It found an eager new audience in grand public buildings, like this one here at St George's Hall in Liverpool, thanks to a new class of aristocrats. But wealth and power in Imperial Britain also belonged to captains of industry, and these magnates wanted to bring the music of the masters to the masses. What they did was build huge neoclassical concert halls and in them imperial-sized organs. The builder they usually called upon, as at Blenheim, was Father Willis. Henry Willis IV still continues in his great-grandfather's organ-building tradition. He even shares his ancestors' Victorian work ethics. Um, tell me a little bit about a big Victorian builder like Willis. I mean, was this a big operation? How many people would have worked there? Now, there's an interesting point. All of them, as opposed to nowadays when almost none of them work. Ah. <laughs> but there were 380 odd of them really? in the firm. Do you know why Willis developed so well over the years? Because it really became such a premier builder, didn't they? Yes. It developed partly because of his interest in music and, the, and music in the church, partly because he was uh, extremely self-assured, as many Willises are reputed to be, and, of course, he wasn't hampered by the Briberies and Corruptions Act 1901, which uh, g gave a much freer hand to people who, in those days, were able to have patrons. Uh, he was wise enough to have patrons, indeed, sometimes more than one, unknown to each other, the normal technique was to get the church to pay for half the organ and each of the pa patrons to pay for half as well. This made some organ building quite profitable. Was he a colourful character? Do we know much about him? Well, we know that he was uh, <coughs> married to his second wife, who was his first wife's sister, courtesy of a vicar of a London church at the time, although it was illegal. That church has a three-manual Willis organ for which they never paid and which does not <laughs> appear in our books. <laughs> Uh, when they were making these huge town hall organs in the 19th century, um, there was a sort of feeling of trying to outdo each other, wasn't there? A sort of certainly. rivalry. Certainly. That was the time. I, I, I want one bigger and better than the one you've just built down road. Because <laughs> I'm a richer mill owner. <laughs> there must have been more to it than that. There must have been something that, that really made people want this Willis sound rather than anybody else's. Well, it was merely because the Willis sound was available in so many concert halls and um, town halls and city halls and the Royal Albert Hall and the Alexandra Palace and St Paul's Cathedral, Canterbury Cathedral, Gloucester Cathedral, Hereford Cathedral, Exeter Cathedral and so forth. And the people were snobs and they wanted the best. And uh, they were determined that the best was Willis and Willis assured them that the best was Willis and they purchased it. The 19th century uh, music for organ is full of um, transcriptions of orchestral pieces of the time as well. There's a, very much a symphonic sound, isn't there? Of course. There was no radio, television or things stuffed in people's ears mm. and they wanted to hear music. So, for example, here in the St George's Hall in Liverpool there were two recitals on a Saturday. One was for the musically educated snobs who came in the late afternoon and the other was for the Hoi Polloi who paid a penny to get in, which was a lot of money. Mm. And this was why the transcriptions were written. It's why the organs played the stuff they did. It was a bit like Classics for Pleasure before its time, wasn't it? I've never heard of Classics for Pleasure. <laughs> I don't believe it. Most people only saw huge organs like those at big public concerts. But the Victorians didn't want just to listen to music, they were great doers. And if you wanted to play the organ in your own home and you couldn't afford Henry Willis, there was a cheaper, more portable alternative.
The idea of an organ just made up of reeds, no pipes, and a simple pair of bellows wasn't, of course, a new one. But when it was reinvented in the 1880s, the reed organ, or harmonium, became immensely popular. It still is, in fact, with Phil Fluke, who has a stupendous collection of them here on the edge of Bradford in the Victorian village of Saltaire. Ah, there's the man himself, Phil. Hello, Howard. Hey, what are you up to there? Welcome to the Reed Organ and Harmonium Museum. I'm just doing a bit of work on Bose and K's N Harmonic Harmonium. Right. Putting some reeds back into it. Well, I hope you feel better a bit later. Nice <laughs> to meet you. Yeah, and you. It's a really an amazing collection, this. I mean, how many years has it taken to collect all this? Just over 20 years. I went to buy a piano for my wife, came home with a harmonium. It didn't work. I learned how to fix it, and it's grown from there. Gosh, and do you fix them all from this uh, equipment round here, all these? Yes, I use many original tools yes. still. And of course, I use hot animal glue, lambskin tanned with salt and alum, all the, mm. all the original materials. Yes. yes, an original bottle of Grolsch there, which is presumably a very important ingredient. <laughs> <laughs> well, show me around some yes. of the... I mean, there are different models around the place. There's large instruments here from Chaffee. Phil took me on a tour of some of his favourite harmoniums. Yeah. The ladies' boudoir model. Ah. 1881. I've always wanted to sit in a lady's boudoir. Well, of course, you'd need a bustle oh, if you yeah. go over the rail at the back. Yes. <laughs> you have all the velvet drapes around the boudoir. Yeah. So they've echoed those under the keyboard. Yes. And, of course, it's black, which was very fashionable because of Prince Albert dying. Queen Victoria wore black for the rest of her life. Now, if I remember rightly, these two sort of prongs here on the side, you move with your knees. That's correct, you Make yes. it get louder and stuff. Does this yes. one work? Can I play? Yes, it does, yes. Well, let me pull yes. some stops out. Yes. Well, it feels very much like a lady's boudoir when I play. It does, isn't it? Yeah. Quite a delicate little instrument, really. Yes, and there's Queen Victoria sitting Indeed there. So. Yes. They sent these things all over the empire, didn't they? They were transported to most countries. I've even a picture of one of them being transported on the back of a camel in Egypt. Really? What about other favourites of yours? Well, I have a little device here that, um, you know, sort of delights people. If you want to go on holiday, you can't find a replacement organist for a Sunday. You yeah. bought one of these, popped it on the top of the keyboard. The organist would write out the tune for you in yeah. numbers. Yeah. And when you press down the numbered button... So anybody can play with two fingers and no musical talent. Yeah, but what happened when the organist came back and they said, well, thanks very much, but we don't need you after all, we've got the knobs. Look, I've even heard some people say that this is better than some organists because at least it plays the right chords. Mm. <laughs> Most people think that the harmonium's gone out of fashion these days. Well, it just shows how wrong you can be. <laughs> From Bombay to Bradford, the portable harmonium is still the centrepiece of a living musical tradition. The next chapter of the organ's development concerns an eccentric telephone engineer called Bob. Robert Hope Jones was an English inventor who, whilst chief electrician of the Lancashire and Cheshire Telephone Company, invented the diaphone, an organ pipe so frighteningly loud it was used by coast guards all over the world as a foghorn. <laughs> Anyway, in 1903, Hope Jones emigrated to America, where he set up an organ company with a financial backing of Mark Twain. Sadly, just six years later, the company went bust, and the patents and plant were bought by a Mr. Rudolf Wurlitzer. Wurlitzer went on to make 20-odd thousand theatre organs, a lot of money, and history. Poor Hope Jones, on the other hand, took his own life, never knowing what foot-tapping joy his inventions would bring for generations to follow.
Here at Blackpool's Tower Ballroom, people have been dancing to the mighty Wurlitzer every summer season since 1930. Most of them rather better than me. The Wurlitzer maestro, Phil Kelsall, has been organist at the Tower Ballroom for 22 years. Yes, well, the other dancers breathe a sigh of relief as I leave the dance. You're very good. You've been practising. <sighs> Not really, no. <laughs> now, we've got the mighty Wurlitzer here. What makes this different from, say, a traditional church organ, then? Well, basically, is the, is the tremulance and the, the stop layout. On the church organ, we have the classic diapason, the sound we all know. But on this organ, the basic sound is called the tibia, which is a wooden pipe, and uh, on its own, sounds like a flute, really. Yeah. But when we add the tremulant, we get a shimmering tone, which is so uh, synonymous with the cinema organ. But the Wurlitzer keyboard doesn't only play pipes. Hidden in a loft high above the organ is a huge box of musical tricks. You also have um, special effects and percussion on an organ like this, don't you? Yes, we do indeed. Uh, these instruments were designed to accompany the silent film, so we're, consequently we have things built in like horses' hooves, a snare drum, a tambourine, we have the xylophone, sleigh bells. And down on the pedal, uh, we have a, a train. As film soundtracks became more sophisticated, most Wurlitzers sank below the stage forever. Some of them are now in private homes and collections. Many others have sadly been destroyed. Electrical technology that allowed theatre organs to expand also opened up new possibilities, even in the church. From the turn of the century, a race began to build ever more impressively sized instruments. And although Passau Cathedral in Germany is pretty huge, if you really want big, big, you've got to come to America. The biggest church organ in the world is in here the Cadet Chapel of the West Point Military Academy. Now, at first sight, it looks really rather like any church organ, so I think some further investigation may be required. The West Point organ owes its vast size to an unusual tradition. Over the last 85 years, the families of cadets killed in action have been able to commemorate their loved ones with a donation of organ pipes. David Friedel, the curator of the West Point organ, led me to the nerve center that makes this massive machine possible. What are these big banks of electrical things here? Well, these are the relays, console relays. When the organist uh, plays any key, one of these is activated. You can actually watch the player play without hearing the, the organ. Is it, with the organ above us now thundering away, I feel like this is, we're in the scene from the Phantom of the Opera or something, in this well, underground room and the bellows heaving away. It's very much like that. Should we go and have a look at uh, some other rooms? There's plenty to see. You okay. go ahead. This system of electrical relays has liberated the organ from the console. Now, the only limit to the number of pipes is the size of your building. If you can squeeze in here, Howard, this is the 32-foot Ophiclide. Oh, my goodness. It looks like huge central heating pipes. It was put in here because there wasn't enough room to stand it up in the organ. Yes. Would you like can we to try one? Sure. Push one of those valves in. Now, there's a man sound for you. <laughs> Sounds like a foghorn. It's a man sound. <laughs> Can't you picture yourself out on your boat? <laughs> Everybody gets out I of your way. I can picture myself on my own somewhere. I tell you, making a noise like this. <laughs> I don't have many friends left, do you? <laughs> uh, see, the organ full of variety and spice. Okay, I'm going up there, am I? 
Go right ahead. I feel like a chimney sweep. Maybe may a bit dusty for you. Oh, dust. Uh, it's nothing. Six, six floors, straight up. Right. Car oh, <laughs> miles up. Oh. That's the harmonic organ, and it's, it's six stories high. Ah, right. It's very easy to lose someone in this division. <sighs> yes. Hmm. More organ. <sighs> No, that's not right. How on earth they tune these things, I do not know. Keep expecting to find some old organist who's been left up here. You must get pretty fit coming up these days, don't Well, you? you would think I would. I wish I was more fit. It's a long way up here. Now, Howard, around this corner here, up a few steps, is the hidden treasure. The hidden treasure. It's the <laughs> swell division. Goodness, it's colossal. Don't you guys ever know when to stop building? Not till we run out of space. Well, I think I've seen enough pipes to last me a lifetime, Dave. What kind of console will drive an organ like this? A large one. Well, there's big and there's jai blooming enormous. This petrified forest is just one small part, the string division of the world's largest organ, the Wanamaker organ in Philadelphia. <music> Whilst at West Point, the organ has an extravagant 20,000 pipes, the Wanamaker instrument weighs in at a giddy 29,000. The company founder, John Wanamaker, had the organ brought here in 1909 to what is now Hex Department Store. It's still played every day as an accompaniment to one of the great leisure pursuits of our time, shopping. This Cathedral of Commerce represents the highest peak of organ folly but it is surely one of the wonders of the musical world.